in 80 days, adventurer and award-winning filmmaker Paul G. Roberts retraces the global footsteps of Phileas Fogg, hero of Jules Verne's most famous work. Jules Verne's most famous book, Around the World in 80 Days, set the Victorian era alight in 1872. An adventure novel with a grand dream of circumnavigating the globe in just three months. A feat never thought possible before. I'm Paul Roberts, an award-winning filmmaker and media entrepreneur. And in my next adventure travel series, 80 Days, I'm going to attempt to retrace the footsteps of Jules Verne's most famous hero, Phileas Fogg, as he attempts to travel the world in 80 days. So why me and why now, you may ask? Well, for the longest time, I've had an obsession with the romance of travel. I've been blessed to have been around the world many times. In fact, I'm on my eighth passport. I had one stolen by a professional gang of thieves on a Vaporetto in Venice, and another one is misplaced, but I have all the other six. In my many travels, I've seen many amazing places, met so many amazing people, and done lots of crazy things. Too many to, to count. My one great regret is that aside from having a few little snaps here and there, I never documented it properly. But this time, that's all changing, as I'm recording all of my adventures for a new adventure travel series 80 days.
The remarkable culture of ancient Japan was built on the ideals of order, harmony, and self-improvement. And whilst these early core values guided the early history of Japan, they remain key factors in the success of modern day Japan. The land of the rising sun is steeped in honor and tradition, but has not without its contradictions. The ancient Japanese sought order and decorum, but they believed that mythology of the land arose from chaos. Peace and harmony and Zen are emphasized. However, ancient Japan was defended by the legendary samurai and shogun warriors. many empires, fabricated stories were created to help position rulers as the divine gods. And Her Highness Japan Empress Regnant Genmi on the 18th day of the ninth moon, of the fourth year of Wado, which is November the 3rd, 711, commanded her servant Yasumaro, who was an upper division, first class, fifth rank, order of merit, to select and record these old words and dutifully lift them up to her. Yasumara went on to render the fables, legends, and vaguely understood myth of ancient times. It was kind of like he was writing the Old Testament of the Bible for Japan. And he made these myths appear as fact, thus creating a divine fable to legitimize and deify the rule of his very human imperial masters and the right of his people, the Yamato, to dominate all the other tribes and peoples of the land we now know as Japan. He described how Izanagi and Izanami created the islands, the mountains, the rivers, the herbs and trees and drops of water from a coral spear. Then they begat the Lord of the universe, the sun goddess Amaterasu, the greatest of their divine children. And she sent her grandson, Ninigi no Mikoto, to earth as the first ruler of the land. But it was not only Ningi who descended to earth, his father, Susano no O, god of storms, uncouth and brash, who was banished from heaven for his foul and evil behavior, while Suza Nono, people conquered and flourished in, in Izumo, in the west of the island of Honshu, Ningi's people also prospered and multiplied in the south. Within three generations, they'd grown powerful enough to thrust north into central Honshu, battling foes to establish a new power base. Its names were myriad, but most know it as the Yamatai. Yamatai was ruled over by an emperor, Jimmu, the first of a line that was to last forever. Of course, it was not probably quite as Yasumaro told it. For Yasumaro to serve a deity, the imperial line required divine blood. And so Yasumaro wove the myriad myths of the Yamato people into a solid story. And in doing so, discovered a royal lineage that stretched back to the sun herself. The Amaterasu of his story was probably based upon the legendary great third century shaman queen, Himiko. Her brother and his fight with her may have represented a royal disagreement as much as a heavenly battle. His was a work of propaganda akin to the Roman Aeneid, 
which wove together vaguely remembered myth, heroic legend, and outright fabrications to legitimize the rule of Augustus Caesar in Rome, or the secret history of the Mongols, which did the same for none other than Genghis Khan. The original settlers of Japan, however, came in a far more human guise. The first crossed land bridges from the Asian mainland tens of thousands of years before, and they continued to arrive in small groups from all directions for eons afterwards. The population was small, perhaps 160,000 at its height. And so these people, called Jomon, after the rope patterns they left on their pottery, are thought to have lived a life of hunting and gathering the plentiful resources found around them. They did not know of war until a new people began to make landfall. And these were the people whose myths Yasumaro wrote as facts. The many-fenced palace of the god of storms was copied across islands by a new and acquisitive, ambitious people who coveted the land and protected a newly engineered resource, the rice field. And they are known as the Yayoi people. And Japan would never be the same again. The ancient Chinese kingdom of Wu, where Shanghai stands today, was believed by the ancient Japanese to be where their ancestors came from. And refugees from that kingdom which was destroyed around the time that the Yayu are believed to have migrated to Japan. Descriptions of the Wu and the Wo, as the Japanese were originally known in Chinese, their tattoos and warlike nature, certainly seems to bear more than a passing resemblance. The archeological and DNA records show that a large body of the Yayo period Japanese came from the, the north, Siberia, coming through Mongolia and Manchuria down the Korean Peninsula and then across the seas. Some modern research also suggests that material and cultural similarities with civilizations, and with civilizations on Java and other parts of Southeast Asia may also exist. What is certain, however, is that the Yayoi people were not the final pre-Japanese history humans to migrate to the Japanese Isles. Sometime in the first few centuries of the Common Era, a time of turmoil and war on the continent, a massive wave of people come from northern China, bringing with them material wealth and knowledge to improve just about every facet of Japanese life. Some became nobles, had their names recorded and entered into the chronicles. Place and family names connected in modern Japan with these ancient settlers can be found to this day, but the exact details of early Japan can still said to be lost in the linguistic and cultural mists of time, which leaves us with the mystery of just who are the Japanese. Japan had a strict social
his people. And from this rift emerged the Soga clan, which played an important role in the future of Japan. One of the guiding principles of the Soga clan was the belief that the nation should be both wealthy and mighty. The role of government, they felt, was to build the country's riches and amass a powerful military, a mantra still prevalent today. And in the third century, when the Soga clan ruled ancient Japan, Buddhism arrived on the shore of the Japanese island. Now in 300 AD, Buddhism may have come by way of missionaries, purposely sent to convert the Japanese court, or the belief system may have had a more organic origin coming to Japan with immigrants from India and possibly China. Regardless of its origins in Japan, Buddhism became the religion of the royal class. The widespread acceptance of Buddhism opened the floodgates to other Chinese beliefs that poured into ancient Japan, including Taoism and Confucianism. It was an age of enlightenment for people of the land of the rising sun. The Chinese also influenced the royal titles and imperial hierarchy of the Japanese people. Although the Japanese didn't adopt the titles of emperor and empress until the early 8th century, they made the titles retroactive. They changed the official court records to add the titles of emperor or empress to the rulers of the Yamato dynasty dating back centuries. A political coup in the 7th century ousted the former Yamato rulers, and Emperor Kotoku seized control. He appointed his nephew, Prince Naka, as the head of the state, and together they ushered in a wave of new reforms that moved ancient Japan from a royal system to a true imperial system. The imperial government assumed leadership over clans, removing power from the clan chieftains. And to keep the power centralized, the rulers repossessed ancestral lands that once belonged to the clan chieftains. They also implemented a system for the collection of taxes and appointed their own priests to the network of Buddhist temples. All of Japan was sectioned off into provinces, with a provincial inspector reporting back to the central government. And all of this was re reminiscent of Chinese structure, demonstrating the influence that China had on its island neighbors. What followed next was an era called the Golden Age of Classical Japan. Political control passed from leader to leader, either by succession, abdication, or coup. It may appear to have been a time of instability, but culturally, Japan was thriving. Interactions with Korea and Japan were declining, allowing the Japanese to come into their own as a society. Art and literature, uniquely Japanese, emerged. And this is also when the Japanese form of writing, kanji or kana, emerged. Based loosely on the Chinese writing system, kanji or kana had fewer symbols and was easier to learn. And today, Japanese people still use the kani, kana or kanji system of writing. As Japan isolated itself from the influences from Korea and China and became more self-reliant, the imperial system of government relaxed. No longer was all the power concentrated centrally, but more authority fell back onto the regional and provincial nobles and clan leaders. Tighter trade restrictions were put in place and merchants relied on the barter system so much that the government halted the minting of coin and currency. The economy declined. It only became stable again after 1040 AD, when the central government instituted a series of reforms. Samurai warriors, the fighting unit used by various Japanese clans, battled with each other for power. Now synonymous with Japan, the samurai class affected areas of life in Japan for centuries, beginning in the 1100s. Basically, hired thugs, albeit noble, prestigious, and well-trained thugs, the samurai worked 
as retainers for the noble landowners of Japan. And over time, the samurai warriors developed a strict code of ethics and morals. And this was called Bushido. They were loyal, brave, and unwavering in battle. They were skilled in military tactics, weapon making, and also diplomacy. And coexisting with the samurai was the shogun. Beginning around 1185, the shoguns were emperor-appointed rulers that supported the figurehead emperors. And as the position evolved, the shogun class became a hereditary post, with their sons taking over from fathers or uncles. As a group, the shoguns were often referred to as bakufu, meaning tent government. Shoguns completed the actual administrative work of the government, but their positions were temporary hence the term tent government. The jobs of individual shoguns may have been temporary, but the institution itself lasted for seven centuries. Both the samurai and the shogun traditions ended in the mid 1800s during the Meiji Restoration. And as Japan entered the late medieval period around 1300, the land of the rising sun moves closer and closer to modern Japan we know today. In the 1460s, however, power was slipping away from the shoguns and into the hands of the feudal landowners, and a new civil war broke out, leading to a decade-long conflict in the 1460s and early 1470s. The war ended without a clear victor on either side, but it did end the shoguns' control of the feudal lords. The feudal lords were then free to rule over their lands as they saw fit only passing regard to the word of the emperor. And while wars were being completed and fought, battles for power were waged. And this was the way of life of the Japanese that was evolving into a more complex society. Japanese society is one of the most complex on earth because it took on aspects of its diverse history, different systems of rule and influence from other cultures. The transition of power from clan chieftains to kings to emperors to shoguns to samurai warriors and more left the Japanese people with a complicated network of class structures that extended from nobility to the peasant farmers and social outcasts. Slavery officially ended in Japan in 1590 when the concept of owning another human was deemed morally wrong. However, forced labor and underpaid workers continued to be an issue. The emergence of the merchant class and artisan class in Japan added to the complexity of society, but also served as an indicator of a strong economy. The Japanese people appreciated the fine quality goods such as silk and swords produced by artisans and willingly paid a fair price for them. Likewise, Merchants allowed the people to buy the items they needed, like cloth, tools, and food. Some members of the artisan class and the merchant class became wealthy and influential. However, their lack of nobility put them in an awkward place in the hierarchy of Japanese society. For all its complexities, Japanese society was also rather rigid and unforgiving. Most people stayed in the class in which they were born and there was little upward mobility. That rigid societal norms were especially evident in the role of women in society. In the upper echelon of society during Japanese classical era, women enjoyed more equality than ever before. There were also several female rulers. Either they were empresses or queens who actively ruled their people. And when Buddhism was introduced into Japan, the role of women diminished because part of the Buddhist belief system was the family unit was led by a patriarch. Sons were valued over daughters, and women were seen as impure. Male family members controlled the female members who were prohibited from inheriting land, making their own marriage choices and living on their own. Marriages were arranged for political and economic gain. And whilst the samurai and the shoguns may make ancient Japan look like warlike and aggressive. The art, music and literature of the time reflected the exact opposite. The style of painting evokes a sense of calm and serenity, 
Mostly nature scenes were done in watercolor. The paintings were beautiful in their simplicity. And like the watercolors, Japan's most famous style of poetry focused on nature. The haiku may seem uncluttered on the surface, but are written following a specific and unbending set of rules. In Japanese music, performed on traditional instrument, such as the double reed flute, 13 string zither, and three string lute, the moments of silence between notes were just as important as the music itself. It even translated to Japanese dance. During performance, dancers will pause in their movements during moments of silence in the music. And while the art and literature of ancient Japan centered on harmony with nature, the music and dance focused on the emotions of the human experience. The land of the rising sun remains a place in which strict social rules dictate the way of life for many Japanese. The country moved from a land of warring clans to a technologically advanced nation with a strong economy and a global presence. Yet remnants of ancient Japan can still be seen throughout modern culture in the old temples and palaces, the art and music, the code of honor and respect, and the poetry of ancient Japan.